Okay. Okay, I think we are going to start. Um, as people keep coming, they will just join in the middle of the talk. Um, so, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. I know it's hard to wake up that early on a Saturday, so I appreciate the effort. Uh, my name is Leo. Uh, I, I am founder uh, of Migraph, so actually allow me to introduce myself a little bit, um, if I manage to make this work. <coughs> yeah, that's the other way. Uh, okay, so um, just a little bit of my story so that you know uh, my background. Uh, so I come from this little country called Nicaragua in Central America. I grew up in Colombia, so uh, I did a uh, bachelor in computer science in Paris, a uh, master in distributed systems. Uh, then I did a PhD in Tokyo, uh, focusing on high performance computer and supercomputers. Uh, I, did, I was there for four years, and then I got a postdoc uh, position at the Harvard National Laboratory, which belongs to the Department of Energy of the United States uh, in Chicago. I worked in uh, scientific computing and resilience for high performance computing for three years. Then I moved to the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, which I happen to have a colleague here, ex colleague. Um, I worked there for six years uh, as a senior researcher. Uh, then I moved as a researcher uh, at the Codex team in Status, and uh, now I'm the founder of Megalabs, and I also maintain the uh, uh, research position with Status. Uh, so I started doing uh, research in blockchain technology in 2018. Uh, I contacted the Ethereum Foundation because they were working on scalability, and since I was working with uh, supercomputers and high performance computer, I, computers, I thought maybe there's something I can contribute there. And so they said, yeah, sure, come. Uh, and then they had a, they plan a meeting in Taipei um, uh, in March of 2018. And uh, that was kind of the beginning of Ethereum 2, what at the moment was called Ethereum 2, now it's forbidden to call it Ethereum 2. But basically, the idea was to uh, implement scalability and sustainability in Ethereum. Sustainability meaning proof of stake and scalability sharding. And so there is this uh, large amount of people that are quite a number of uh, famous faces there, and not so famous, uh, like me. Uh, and, but it was like a great opportunity to start working with all these people, and uh, since then I have been collaborating for, with them for over five years. And so what I'm going to present here today is more or less the trajectory of you know, all this research going on from 2018, 2020, up to today. So um, let's start by the genesis. Uh, so the beginning of the Bitcoin chain uh, that started to be prototyped or kind of put in a concrete specification in 2020. And um, that's, uh, you know, we have been part of the conversation for, uh, for all those years. Uh, and then uh, there were several implementations going on about the different consensus layer clients. And um, they started running on the, fir in the first test nets before the Bitcoin chain was alive. Uh, one of them was the Medalla testnet, right? And uh, so there were thousands of nodes running on these testnets, but nobody really knew uh, what was the distribution of the different clients in the in the network at that time. So you know they knew that they were running different implementations, but nobody had any idea about what was the distribution among those different implementations. So that's what we say. Okay, maybe we can actually try to tackle that question. Uh, which are the most you see uh, consensus layer clients in the Bitcoin chain? And so for that, we wrote a crowder that is called Army Arma. Uh, it's open source, uh, it's in GitHub, you can access it, you have the QR code there. And uh, we also published uh, an article at the BCCA conference in 2021 in Tartu, Estonia. And uh, basically, we published the results of our study about the distribution of clients and all the other things that we discovered with this, uh, with this uh, crowder. Now, uh, at the time, nobody liked the results of what we published. Uh, and the reason why we didn't like it is because um, basically 70% of the network was using the same clients, and the 30% of the rest was distributed among the other three, four clients. Okay? And that's a really bad distribution. Uh, of uh, clients uh, in, in, the, in the network, okay? So I want to talk a little bit more about this later, um, but then we move on. So uh, at that moment then we thought like, okay, why is everybody using the same client? And why they don't you know, try different options? I thought maybe they have different performance, right? Maybe a client, if there's a client that is more performant than the other. And so 
Then we decide, okay, let's try to uh, find out what is the performance, what are the performance differences between consensus layer clients. So we did that study, and we try to analyze, so we run all different clients, all the five, actually six clients with Grandin, which is uh, another one, this is not open source, but we, we tested it as well. And we monitor uh, the execution of these clients, uh, both in terms of CPU usage, disk usage, memory usage, network bandwidth, a uh, number of fields that are connected with, and in different configurations, in different types of hardware. We tested on a normal hardware, we also tested on a like, big fat node uh, with a lot of memory, a lot of CPU, etc. We also tested on Raspberry Pis, etc, uh, etc. Et I'm not going to present all that because I, that would be an entire talk. Um, but if you want to look at those results, uh, you can access the, this paper here. Uh, which was published at the Brains Conference in Paris, uh, and uh, you have the QR code there. And, uh, so basically, yeah, we can see that the different clients have you know, different CPU usages. Uh, this one is, has a very high CPU usage, but others are more conservative. There are some clients that use a lot of more disks than others. Um, we noticed also that there was a client that had a memory leak, which is the blue curve here. This is when it reached the maximum memory allowed, and then it crashed, and then we had to restart it. Uh, we communicate all these files, of course, to the to the developers of the different plans, and they fix this uh, this memory leak. Um, and then, uh, yeah, many 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 other findings. But overall, what we found is that uh, basically there is really not much difference in performance among the different clients, and you can actually run uh, any of them, and you will have more or less the same results. Um, uh, however, there was this difference on, on, on you know, distribution. And I think the main reason for that was probably the, uh, how easy or, or accessible it was to launch a client versus the other, right? Uh, the others were probably more difficult to, to, uh, to use than people would just go with the easy thing, which is you know, already pre-compiled or you can just easily deploy or whatever. And then um, that was probably the main reason. So that led to a lot of efforts into you know, making the clients uh, more accessible for everyone. There was a lot of you know, push for client diversity in the, in the recon chain, and so on and so forth. So um, there was this website that uh, is called clientdiversity.org. Uh, at the time, there was a lot of, as I say, effort to try to diversify different clients. Uh, and what we have today is something that looks more or less, more or less like this, which is much better than what we had at the time. Uh, so these are the results with the same crowder at Myanmar. I thought this is version two, and uh, we can see that it's more or less like 40 percent for uh, 40 percent for the two main um, the two main uh, or more or most used consensus layer clients, and then the other ones uh, are around 10 percent, 7 percent, and so on. Right. Uh, by the way, this website uh, client diversity that are um, uh, actually shows the uh, distribution of different clients in real time, and they also take uh, data from, from us, from Eagles, uh that we provide through an API to them uh, in real time. Uh, by the way, of course, as I said at the beginning, this crawler is open source, so any of you can run it in your node, and you can get all this data by yourself. You will get, you will get way more data than what we show here, and, and you can actually use that for your uh, studies. So um, now another thing that we wanted to analyze was what is the energy consumption of the entire network? And um, actually, that happened to be around the time of the merge, right? Uh, so the Bitcoin chain was launched in December 2020, and then uh, there was a lot of effort uh, toward the merge, which was a transition from proof of work to proof of stake, right? And then um, since the whole purpose of doing this was sustainability. A lot of people started asking, how much energy are we going to save by stopping proof of work and starting proof of stake? And so there were some estimations that we would switch, you know, we would change the energy consumption by 99.5% or something like that. Uh, and those are great, great numbers. Uh, but, you know, the University of Cambridge approaches, and I say, hey, we have this dashboard that is super famous and, and shows the energy consumption of the Bitcoin network in real time. We want to do the same for Ethereum. But for that, we need to know the size of the network. And apparently, there is nobody in the, in the space that knows that except you guys, because you have this crawler that is connecting with all the nodes all the time. And then you have an idea of how many nodes are running in the network uh, at, uh, at every time. So we have this real-time 
uh, dashboard that shows the number of nodes that are running in the network. Uh, and then we pass this data through an API to them so that they have uh, they, they use this number of nodes with a specific mathematical model that estimates the energy consumption of, of, of each node. And then they more or less, based on that, they, they can say that the energy consumption of the of the network, of the Ethereum network, is about 725 um, kilowatts. Um, and then they have a lot of other data. They have a lower bound and a theoretical upper bound. You can see that this lower bound and upper bound are quite quite distant from the from the estimated. And this is because we still have a lot of questions in in in, in this model uh, of uh, energy prediction. And uh, so we are still trying. To, we are still working actually on refining these 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 bounds. Uh, in, in order to have a much more accurate uh, estimation. But anyway, you can visit this uh, address if you are interested on, on, on checking this dashboard, if you didn't know it, uh, know it yet. So this is another kind of uh, question that we managed to tackle using this crawler. Uh, at the beginning, we were not even thinking about that this could be useful for this, but uh, this is what happened in research. You start something and you realize later on that that can be useful for something else. And um, then we noticed that if there are other questions that we could answer uh, thanks to this crowd. For example, um, there was many, many discussions uh, in the ecosystem about, uh, you know, is, is it Ethereum really decentralized or are we all running for AWS, right? It's like, if Amazon wants to shut down all the servers tomorrow, uh, is Ethereum still going to be alive or not, right? And so uh, this is again another question that we could tackle uh, based on this on the data that we have from the crowder, because in the crowder we get the ID of the nodes that we connect with, right? And so since we have the ID, we can use any of the standard API that there is in the web in order to know the ISP or the internet provider that is behind that uh, IP address, right? And if that internet provider is started by Amazon LLC, then well, you kind of know that it's that AWS, right? Uh, if it's started by Vodafone or uh, you know, uh, whatever, Movistar or something like that, then you know that it's probably just a residential uh, place, right? A home uh, or something like that. And so we did that study and uh, uh, we managed to get an idea about the distribution in the network. Uh, so about 50% of the nodes uh, are running on cloud. Uh, about 35% of them are running on homes, uh, what we call home staking. And then we have uh, about 15% of them that we are still not sure yet because there are more like weird names that we don't really know. Uh, there are many companies you know, in, in other countries that are not that famous, that are probably uh, internet providers that, or, or just clouds that we still don't know. So there's a, uh, there's a manual process that is very tedious and we still have to work on that. Uh, and then there is a lot, there is a other, uh, what we call other here is like 2%. And these are universities, uh, financial institutions, uh, and so on and so forth that are running nodes as well, for either for research purposes or for something else. Now, one question that you might ask is, okay, that about this 50%, how much is Amazon Cloud? And is, I think, something in the order, I mean, we have the data, but I don't remember right now. It's, I think it's something in the order of 40%, uh, something like that. 40% of this 50%, uh, or less, I think it was, in total, I think it was 26% of the nodes were running on Amazon Cloud. So even if Amazon run, shoots down everything today, about 75% of the network should still be running online. Okay. Then, um, so that was another question that we could answer with this crowder. Uh, and then um, one of the things that uh, someone mentioned to us is, okay, that's all very cool. You are showing all this data about different nodes in the network and everything, but those are just nodes. Those are not validators. Because you can run a node in the network without having any validator behind, right? So it might say, it might mean that yeah, we have, for example, as I mentioned before, uh, oops, sorry, we have uh, like only 26% of the nodes are running on Amazon Cloud. But it could be the case that all the validators are, are in within, within those 26%, right? Uh, and then uh, then the distribution is not as good as we thought it is, right? So they ask us, how is it possible for you to know which nodes? Are actually running on uh, are running validators. Turns out we can, and that was actually unexpected for us. But uh, there is something we can do, and we can see in the network to try to answer that question. So uh, nodes have to register to different attestation networks uh, if they want to validate, uh, if they want to validate blocks, or if they want to validate uh, to, to, to make transactions or validate transactions, 
or aggregate transactions. Basically, if you are running a validator, you have to subscribe to at least one of the spatial networks. There are multiple sub-networks in, in the Ethereum network. There are five main networks, which one, one is to distribute blocks, another one is to distribute the slashings, another one is to distribute, don't remember exactly what, but there were five of those. And then we have 64 that are for uh, distributed at the stations, right? And if you're a validator, you have to subscribe to at least one of those at the station networks, and you have to say this to your peers when you connect to them, okay? When you connect, for example, if I connect to you, I have to tell you, okay, this is my, the other, this is, I mean, this is what uh, the information I have uh, from me, and I am subscribing to this attestation network. So everything that you see in that attestation network, please send it to me because I'm interested in that, right? So uh, based on that, actually, we can have a distribution that looks more like this, and we can see, and we can see you know, uh, for a specific node, how many attestation networks they are subscribed to. If the attestation network is subscribed to zero, sorry, if the node is, is subscribed to zero attestation networks, that means there is no validators behind that node, okay? And that's the, that's the, the column here, the large column that you see here, is there is about 6,000 nodes in the network that are not subscribed to any attestation network, meaning they are not running any validator, right? Then you have uh, some, um, some of them are subscribed to a, a small number of uh, attestation networks, and then you have uh, some others that are subscribed to all 64 at the station networks. 64 is the limit. So even if you are running 100 validators in, in one node, you will still subscribe to only 64 at the station network because that's the maximum there is. Um, so based on this distribution, we can actually know several things. We can know that there are about 6,000 nodes that are not staking anything, that are no validators. We can see that there is a, a significant proportion of, of nodes that are, we can, we call it home stakers that have one or two or a few number of validators. And then here you have on the other side the, what we call the institutional stakers. So these are likely to be Kraken, Coinbase, Binance, and all those big players that are running hundreds of no, sorry, hundreds of validators in a node. Okay? And so having this information, we can take all the database that we have, and then we filter out the non-staking nodes, and then what remains is most likely a large majority of them are validators. And then we can replot all the figures that I just showed before, and then, can and then we can show this is a distribution only for validators and, and, and not for the entirety of the network, right? And so if you remember in the previous figures, the total was 12,000 nodes. Here the total is about 5,600 nodes. And we can see the distribution. So this is the client distribution. Uh, this is the, the um, cloud versus residence versus uh, unknown. Uh, this is the architecture, uh, and so on and so forth. So we have many other figures that I'm not going to present because I, that will be for another entire talk. Um, but yeah, we can actually show this information only for nodes that have validators uh, behind. Now, if you're interested in looking at this data, uh, you can visit this website. Uh, it's called monitorf.io. Uh, you have the QR code there, and you have all the data in real time uh, showing uh, anything that you want uh, of the entirety of the Bitcoin nodes or uh, the validators, right? Now, um, another question that uh, people asked during uh, close to the uh, merge was, what was the impact of the merge on staking rewards, right? Because before the merge, the validators in the Bitcoin chain, basically they only get at the station rewards, right? Because there was no transactions going on in the Bitcoin chain before the merge, right? The transactions were executed in the other kind of main net that was going in parallel, but there was no real block proposal rewards in, in terms of transactions because there were no transactions in, in, in the legal chain. So, and then at the time also there was LEV coming up, you know, uh, and you know, a lot of people were asking questions about how this is going to affect uh, the rewards for validators and so on. So there was a lot of questions. So. Uh, we tried to tackle that question as well, and then we did this study um, in which we tried to compare uh, the rewards of uh, different entities one month before the merge versus one month after the merge. We published all that data in a, a pretty cute uh, website with a lot of pandas and nice things. It's called Pandametrics. Uh, you have the QR code here, and we also published all the results in a scientific paper at the ICBC conference 
which was presented in Dubai uh, in May this year. Uh, and you have the QR code there if you want to attend, if you want to look at it. Um, there were many results that, again, I will not have the time to present all of them. Uh, but one of them that I want to present is that uh, we can look at the distribution of mining pools before the merge and staking pools after the merge and see whether the board is more centralized or less centralized before or after, right? And so if you look at the uh, before merge, the mining pools that were doing proof of the state, sorry, proof of work, you have Ethermine, F2 pool, and Helium pool that are basically almost half of the network, right? Just between these three pools. And after, after the merge, you have Lido, Coinbase, and Kraken, that if you put them together, uh, this is almost half of the network as well. So you kind of see more or less similar distribution uh, before and after the merge. However, we have, I think we had a larger proportion of solo stakers after the merge. And also it's important to mention that Lido actually is not one single operator, it has multiple operators. So actually if we really want to be completely um, uh, realistic, we should kind of uh, divide Lido in all the other operators and then the, we, the figure we look at a little bit uh, different. So we kind of, either we stay at the same decentralization level in terms of uh, my inputs, stake inputs, or actually kind of became a little bit more decentralized because uh, there are uh, these big providers like Lido that are actually uh, multiple operators and not just one single operator. Um, again, many other interesting results in the paper if you want to take a look at it. Um, now, uh, another question that was asked is what is the geographical, look, I mean, how geographical location affects staking rewards, right? Because uh, it's quite well known that uh, there's a significant difference uh, in latency uh, when your node is in Sydney versus if your node is in Frankfurt, right? Uh, it takes uh, quite a number of milliseconds more uh, to arrive, to packets, uh, for packets to arrive there, right? And that, that, that really has an impact um, uh, on, the, on, the, on software because you, you have basically a block that is produced every 12 seconds and you have four seconds to receive the block, validate it, you know, and do all the, the, the computational work that you need to do in order to you know, produce attestations, aggregate attestations, and so on and so forth. So every millisecond counts. And so we wanted to ask, to, to try to answer this question. And we analyze it, uh, we launch uh, a, a number of nodes distributed among different locations. So we had nodes in Helsinki, in London, in Sydney, in Warsaw. And then we also uh, tried different uh, consensus layer clients, Lighthouse, North Star, Nimbus, Prism, Tech group. And um, basically, uh, just to summarize, again, uh, if you want to look at the details, check the paper. Um, but uh, more or less what we found is that, um, uh, yeah, definitely, uh, you know, geographical location does impact. So if your node is located in Antarctica, it's probably see, it's gonna, gonna see less rewards than if you are in Europe or in North America. Um, However, you can try to compensate to it by, by putting uh, stronger hardware. So if you if you really want to launch your node in Sydney or something like this, you probably need to get a little bit, a little bit, not much, but a little bit higher uh, hardware resources in terms of bandwidth and, and, and you know, the, the, the hardware performance of the node in order to catch up and try to, um, to, to have the same rewards that you would see if you were in North America or in Europe. Um, now, the, the, the performance difference is not huge, so it is something lower than 10%, uh, but you know, 10% might be important uh, you know, in terms of rewards. Uh, so, uh, if, for example, if you want to launch a mining pool, a staking pool, sorry, uh, uh, you might want to decide to do it in North America or Europe because you get more rewards. And that is a bad thing because if everybody thinks that way, then most of the network is going to be located in these places, and then that leads to a bad decentralization aspects because then you know, nations can try to censor uh, nodes or something like that, right? So this is important to take into account, and so we have to make efforts to actually really try to make the network as decentralized as possible and find solutions to have the same rewards uh, all around the world. Um, and one of the last things I want to present is, uh, can we monitor validators' participation in real time? Uh, and so for that we develop a software that is called Gothet, which is also open source. Uh, it tries to index all the data that you have in a, in a decode node into a, a PostQL uh, database so that you can actually play with it and show it. 
And then what we did was that we showed it, uh, we showed it to the world in a website that is called etsir.io. Uh, you have the link here if you want to access it. Uh, it's a real-time uh, blog explorer that shows the blogs that they are producing in real time. And you actually can see what entity produced each blog. For example, I think this one, this is Coinbase, this is Coinbase, this is Kraken, this is Rocketpool, et cetera, et cetera. You can see which entity produced each, uh, each blog. And you can click in the blog and see all the details. Uh, you also have uh, summaries about each epoch, how much uh, participation was it, how many attestations were correct or missed, uh, where, how many blogs were missed, etc., etc. There's a bunch of information there uh, that you can access, access if you're interested. Um, and then one of the last things that uh, we have been uh, working on was uh, distributed validator technology. So this was Oval who contacted us and asked us, hey guys, can you make a study about our software? Can you compare whether uh, distributed validator technology has the same performance as non-distributed validator technology. So if you're not aware of what is distributed validator technology, basically instead of running one node, you run four nodes in different locations. And if one fault uh, uh, has a failure, the other three can keep going, can keep going, and so you don't lose rewards because of that, right? Uh, but the problem is, if you have four nodes, they actually have to achieve consensus before actually sending any block or any attestation. And so that is, you know, there's a latency uh, behind that is important to take into account. So we did uh, the study, we published a, a, a blog post uh, with an entire report. The report is here, you can access it. Uh, again, many interesting results. Uh, I'm just gonna show this one that uh, shows the, um, the rewards uh, versus the maximum uh, reward that they could achieve uh, for different clusters. So we have Five nodes, A, B, C, and D, and E, which are non-distributed validator technology, so non-DBT. And then we have uh, three clusters uh, beyond to oval that have uh, distributed validator technology. And these are clusters of four nodes, seven nodes, and 10 nodes. And please notice that when we are launching 10 nodes, they are all distributed around the entire world. So we have, for the 10 node cluster, we had a node in Sydney, Bangalore, Singapore, San Francisco, London, Amsterdam. So it's really a cluster that is completely distributed around the entire globe, and they act as if it was only one single node in the network to take every decision. And you see that the difference is actually not much. Uh, here, the non dbt uh, nodes get about 92.1% of rewards, and Oval get about 91.7 in terms of rewards. So it's really a minuscule difference, less, less than uh, 0 0.5 percent, uh, so which is a really, really great uh, score for the for the guys. I mean, uh, for not for this really valuable technology in general. So with that, I think uh, this is the end of my talk. Uh, I just want to finish by saying uh, uh, a big thank you to all of our collaborators. So we got received funding from the Terra Foundation, from Lido, from Oval, from Atestan, from Protocol Labs, uh, we have collaboration with uh, yeah, Cambridge University, Status, Dab, Gnosis, and Alpha. And uh, of course, all this work that I have presented is not my work. It's, a, it's the work of a group of people that have been working really, really hard behind. So I want to say a big thank you to them because uh, they are the ones to, that are behind all this that I have presented here. So a big kudos to them. And with that said, thank you very much for your attention. And thank you. Questions? Does anybody have any questions? Oh, right up here. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, please say the mic. In in the DP technology, yeah. how do you decide where are the nodes are going to be? Yeah, uh, what we try to do is to make them, uh, to make it as hard as possible for them. So, uh, if you have the, all the four or seven or ten nodes in, in Amsterdam, and it's too easy, right? What we really want to test is, the, is how well they can perform in the most extreme conditions. So, the, we try to make them as, as, far as, possible, as far as possible in terms of geographical location. So, in different countries, in different continents, and basically, we just try to get nodes where the providers, the cloud provider that we were using, had locations. But in addition to that, we did a second thing: uh, is that we not we did not use all the nodes from one single um, cloud provider because sometimes they have like these fast network lanes or something like that. So we actually use 
nodes from different cloud providers with this in purpose, and in the, in the report you will see that, uh, in order to make sure that not only they are in different continents, but they are also different cloud providers, and they are all working as if it, it was only one node. And we are really wanted to express that, that as much as possible. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, thanks, guys. Thank you, Leo.